today's lecture, we're going to talk about one of the most common patterns in functional programming. And that is accumulating some result by walking over a list, manipulating each element, processing it, and then handling the rest of the list in some way. This is such a common pattern that we've actually given it a name. We're going to illustrate precisely what that is in a few moments. And I'd also like to say the basis for today's lecture is also the core idea behind MapReduce, the core technology that runs the Google search engine and was sort of the main innovation that allowed Google to scale out really nicely. This is implemented in lots of different systems, including MapReduce, but also things like Hadoop and Apache Spark and things like that. So these concepts can actually have really in interesting uses in industry as well. Now, iterating over a list to accumulate some result is one of the most common patterns we see in all of functional programming. And to convince you of that, I'm going to show you a few example functions and how we write them using our traditional direct style recursion. All right, so this first function is called sumList over sumList L. What we're going to do is we're going to match on L. In the case that L is the empty list, we're going to say the sum of the empty list is just zero. Otherwise, when the list is a con cell of some head and some tail, we're going to take the head, we're going to process the tail, and then we're going to add the head to the sum of the tail. All right? So let's look at another example. Now this is list product. What this is going to do is multiply every element in the list together. All right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, in the case where there's an empty list, we're going to use just the value 1. Now, reason is because this is the identity of multiplication. And so when we sum up, or sorry, when we multiply up all of the values in the list, at the end of the day, we're going to have some base case. That's going to be 1, because otherwise we would change the value of our result. So what is a nice identity we can use? Now, in the recursive case, when we have head and a, and a tail, we're going to multiply the head by list product of the tail. All right, and even more elaborate functions, like the function filter, can actually be written using this style. It looks so similar to the style we just saw. We can see all these functions. I can literally change the slide, and they only change in just a few small ways. Now, we're going to talk about precisely what that is in a second, but let's look at filter. What does it do? So filter takes some function f and takes a list l. And it says, if L is the empty list, we're going to return the empty list, because you can't filter anything out of the empty list. Otherwise, if it's a, a con cell of some head and some tail, we're going to say, if F is true of the head, then return cons of head and filter F of the tail. Otherwise, just drop out that head. So to do that, we're going to do filter of F and then tail. All right, so now let's ask ourselves. What do these three functions all have in common? The structure is so common that we're actually going to name this kind of common idiom. So what are we doing? Well, each match is on the list. So we've got a whole bunch of different match statements. They all break apart the list. So that's one thing that they all do. And each of them also returns an initial value. So when we get to the end of the list, each of them has some thing that it does with the empty list. So for the empty list, list product returns 1, sum list returns 0, and filter returns the empty list. All right, so each of them has some way it handles an initial value or something to do for the end of the list. And then finally, each of them makes a recursive call to process the rest of the list, but then it combines that or reduces that with that head result. So it performs this recursive call, gets some value out of that, and then it combines this result for list product, it combines it with head by doing a multiplication. All right? In this case, we process some list, and then we combine it with head by doing addition. In the case of filter, we call filter on the tail in both of these branches. And then we branch on f of head. And we decide whether we're going to add something to that processed tail or just leave that processed tail alone and wrap it through. Now, this is the one that looks most dissimilar from the other two. But we're going to see precisely how we can capture it with the same uniform notion. 
So let's think about how the function sum list operates over lists. And when I say let's think about it, I mean with respect to the list structure, what is going to happen when we call sum list? So I can think of sum list of taking the list structure in right here. Now note, I've written the list structure out using an explicit cons notation. So think back to the cons diagrams, how you would write a list using a fully explicit cons notation. When you write it using that style, you can see that sum list, all sum list is doing is sort of replacing this call to cons with a call to plus, and then taking this argument right here. And then this plus right here, and then for this empty list, producing this empty value. So if we just kind of look at a, a very high level perspective about what some list is doing, I can see the main thing that it's doing is that it's taking that list and then processing it. And the way that it's processing it is it's walking over the list in the same way that the cons structure sort of dictates the structure of the list. It's using that con structure, except instead of cons, we're sort of doing plus. I'll show you a diagram of precisely what this looks like in a second, but there's also this, this zero value. Now, what about the same thing for list product? Well, it's the same exact thing, except instead of plus, it's now gonna be times. All right, so instead of, we've got cons one, and then cons two, and then the empty list, and we've got a times here of one, and then times two, and then there is a special thing we're doing here. Our initial value when we hit that empty list is now going to be one for this case of list product. All right, so that's what that's doing. So we've now explicated this common pattern, which I'm going to call a fold over the list. We'll define fold precisely on this slide, but at a common structure of folds include iterating over a list to accumulate some result. So you have some list that you want to walk over. You want to accumulate some result on that list. You also have a default value to handle the empty list or default or initial value or initial value. And then to combine up the results of the list as you go down it, you're going to call a reducer pro function or a combiner or processor function, all right? So the full definition of fold looks like this. We say that fold is a three argument function. It's going to accept this two argument reducer function, which is going to combine the results. This is the most confusing part of fold. So if this part doesn't make sense to you quite now, wait and we'll see some examples of how it's used and I think it'll get better. There's also an initial value, which is going to tell us what to do to process the empty list. And there's also, or at least the, the sort of initial result. And then there's also the actual list that we want to fold over, that we want to iterate and traverse over. All right, so let's see how we can use fold to implement some list. We'll copy this over. All right, so now I've got my implementation of fold right here, and I've got my implementation of sum list right here. This is our original implementation that's not using fold. So this is our original. And now the challenge is, how do I write a version of sum list that uses fold to do its work? So how can I use fold? How can I use fold to write some list. All right, well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do fold, and then I'm gonna make this reducer function. What this reducer function is gonna do is it's gonna take the current value that's sort of the accumulator and also the next element of the list. Now, the first element or the first argument to this fold is always going to be the, uh, going to be the next element of the list that I'm gonna process. And then I'm also going to have an accumulator and what I'm going to say is that I'm going to add the next element to the accumulator and return that result. And now I need to give fold an initial value. So the initial value for plus is going to be uh, zero, just like it was right here. And then I'm going to uh, use my list. So let's define this as some list using fold, kind of a long name. Probably not something I would write in my day-to-day -day code, but it's fine for our purposes here. 
All right, and then let's run that and we'll see some list using fold. We'll walk through how it works in a second, but let's just make sure it works. All right, results in the value three. All right, so let's see precisely why that's going to be the case. So let's just try it on the uh, much simpler version. So let's take this fold right here. And then let's just execute this on just the list containing just the list containing one and then the empty list. That'll be enough to show what's actually going on under the hood. Okay, well, we're gonna expand this definition of fold. We'll apply textual reduction. So this is going to be match the list of one, and then this over here. And then we're going to have our reducer function is going to be this lambda. So we'll replace that. And then our, uh, all right, that's all good. That's all good. We'll call this, it's gonna get a little bit long because uh, we're replacing our definition here. We'll just copy that lambda right there. Now our initial value is going to be replaced with uh, zero. So we'll replace that here. And then uh, our tail value, okay, is gonna get bound here. So, okay, so now we're matching. So this case is not gonna fire. So it's gonna be this case. So that's going to expand to or reduce to this definition right here. Uh, where we substitute, uh, head is going to be one, and then the tail is going to be the uh, empty list. So now to do this application, I can't apply this to this uh, value yet. This needs to be reduced first. So I need to keep making progress here. So I'm gonna evaluate this argument down to a value. Okay, so let's do that. We'll process this. And this fold right here is going to be, let's expand its definition. This fold right here, let's replace our definition of fold. All right. And now we need to substitute. That's what textual reduction says. So we need our init value was zero. Reducer is this same lambda, that doesn't change. And then the list that we passed in is the, um, is the empty list right here. So we'll substitute that one as well. All right, and now, luckily, doesn't get much gnarlier than this, but we match this one on the empty list so this all turns to zero, right? Because this gets matched with the empty list. Thus, this branch of the match will fire. And that means we're gonna replace this whole thing right here with just, um, with just zero. All right, and now we've just got a function called on two arguments. So now we'll actually perform that application. So to do that, again, just substitution. And next, uh, so our first argument here is going to be one. And then our second argument here is going to be zero. We return this result and we get one. All right, so I encourage you to do that for a little bit longer list now too. I encourage you to see what would do for, uh, for one, two, let's say. One more step and just see how it works. And maybe also try that out with, uh, with the next function we're about to code up. All right, so let's do product list using fold. And that will be our list right here. So we're going to do fold. And now we have a next element and then an accumulator. This accumulator is gonna keep increasing as we walk over the list. And then we're gonna do multiply of uh, next element and then the accumulator, that's gonna get combined. And then we're gonna use one as our zero right here. 
and we're going to process it over the list LST. All right, so now let's see what happens when I execute that. Well, let's do product list using fold. And then we'll do one, two, three. And we get six. All right. Now the final exercise asks us to write the definition of filter list using fold. So this one's a little bit harder, but a lot more fun, I think. So let's go look over at it. So now I have to use fold to write filter. So I'm going to write filter using fold. And then I'm going to take a function f and then the list lst. And here's what I'm going to do. I've got a uh, next element of the list that I'm going to look at. And I'm going to accumulate. I'm going to accumulate and build up a list of everything that should be in the result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, Here's the next element that, that fold is going to hand to me. Remember, fold is going to call this combiner function or this reducer function a whole bunch of times. One for the base case with the end of the list, and then it's going to take that and then pull it back and then give me the rest of the list out as, as far as sort of as I go. All right, so let's think what's going to happen here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say if f is true of the next element of the list that fold is going to hand me, then I'm going to return cons. Let's give our space itself a little bit space here. Then I'm going to do cons of next element and then the accumulator. Otherwise, if f of false of the next element, I'm just going to return the accumulator. All right. And then our initial value here, remember, this is going to be passed in to be consed on. So the first thing that's going to happen when I reach the very bottom of the list is that fold will call this reducer function with this initial value right here. So it makes sense that it it's going to be the right side and the initial accumulator. So this zero element right here, this initial value is always going to be the thing that's used for the accumulator when you get to the very end of the list or sort of to handle the base case. All right, so in this case, it's going to be the empty list because we're going to go to the very end of the list. We're going to return the empty list. And then as we're popping back up the list, kind of going up and up and up and up and up as we're percolating out via our calls to uh, fold, then we're going to rebuild that structure and reconstitute it. So with our base case is going to be this empty list. And then let's do, um, then let's do just this list LST here. All right, so now let's try it out. So let's do filter using fold. And then I can do lambda x. Um, and remember, this is just the function that I'm filtering. So let's just say if x is greater than 5, we'll keep that in our list. And then we'll do 0, 10, 15, negative 20, 21. All right, so it looks like it came up with the right result. We've got 10, uh, and then 15, and then negative 20, but then 21. All right, so it looks like we got it right. Now I just want to briefly point out that the version of fold that we've written is actually written in direct style. So it will push things onto the stack. It's really not a big deal in Racket. And if this style of fold makes sense to you, it's totally fine to program using it. But I'll just point out that this is called a, uh, this is frequently called a right fold. And that's because it bottoms out or processes the right side of the list and then reconstructs it back up. So I got this little diagram right here from the Haskell Wiki. It's one that I often see used to explain fold. And this is a really, really nice way to think about it. So sort of take a few minutes to look at this diagram and see what it's saying. These, uh, these colons are the con cells. And we can see sort of the linear structure of the list right here, where I've got cons of 1 and cons of 2, cons of 3, cons of 4, cons of 5, and the empty list. I can see that what fold is doing over here, this is just another way to write precisely what we wrote on this slide. What fold is doing is it's going to take this structure of this list and it's uh, basically going to, so if I fold, and I take some function f, and then some initial value i, and I give it this list here, what's going to happen is that it's going to replace all the instances of cons 
or conceptually that's what's going to happen. It's going to replace all instances of cons with f. And then it's going to replace this empty list with just i, the initial value that I use. So I can really think of fold as walking over the structure of the list and then reconstituting it by applying it one by one by one. Another way to conceptualize this is kind of like a loop, right? When I get to the very end of the list, I'm going to process this element five right here, and then I'm going to end up combining it and getting some result. So for example, if f is plus of the accumulator and phi, and this z right here is zero, then that would be five plus zero, which would then this f right here is sitting on the stack. That would be 5 plus 4, and then 3 plus 9, and then 12 plus 2, and then 14 plus 1 to get that final result. But note, this fold r, this is the right fold. It does leave something on the stack. All right? So I can write a version of fold that is tail recursive. This is called fold left. And the reason is because it actually starts accumulating from the left. All right, this is actually the picture from Haskell. This is not quite the way that I'm going to write it. I'm always going to put the accumulator as the uh, as the last, uh, the second thing that gets called to the function. That's the racket style. I will also say as a uh, as a warning, a lot of the code out there for Haskell uses a slightly different convention for fold than racket does. This is one of my least favorite things about the racket standard library. I really do not like the fact that the arguments to fold are in a swapped order from Haskell and OCamels, but unfortunately it's just something that you have to be aware of. So this is a version of fold that does not grow the stack. It uses tail recursion. Notice how at the very base case here, we return the accumulator instead of this initial value. But then you pass that initial value in as the initial accumulator. The very first time this function runs on the first element of the list, it's going to call reducer of that first head element, and then the initial value will be this initial accumulator right here. All right? Now this is called a left fold because it starts from the left. All right, let's copy this over. First, let's do an exercise. It's asking us, use fold L to write reverse. And I think you're going to like this trick. It, uh, it's, it's very... All right, so when I do fold L, all I have to do to write reverse is called fold L, and then my function, my reducer function, is just going to accept a next element and then an accumulator, and all it's going to do is cons next element onto the accumulator. All right, and then my initial value is going to be the empty list, because remember, this initial value will get passed in as the initial value for this accumulator right here as I'm walking through the list from left to right. And then I need my list to process. That's L right here. And when I actually, when I run this, well, actually when I run this, it turns out it breaks. Uh, and the reason is because I had the text written on the slide wrong. So it was supposed to be fold L here. But once we call that, when we write reverse, It works exactly as we expect. Now this is precisely for the same reason that things naturally get swapped and end up being reversed when you write them using tail recursion. It's because when you process the list by starting at the front and walking towards the back, there are motorcycles outside the house right now. All right, they're mostly gone. When you process the list from front to back, you just end up with this natural, uh, this natural circumstance where you always end up uh, sort of reversing the order in which you traverse things. All right, so that's our introduction to folds. My biggest takeaways from you are to think about using fold whenever you can. You should be using rackets fold L and fold R. They're mostly the same. Fold L is fold left, fold R is fold right. They just process the list in different order. You can mostly use one in place of the other, but you need to be careful and thoughtful about how this works. Now to use fold, you need two things. You need a two argument reducer function, which is going to take the next element of the list to be processed, and then a current accumulator. And then you also need an initial value for this accumulator that's going to get put in to process the empty list.